after 40 years, uh, five years ago. I've held every position in banking that you can have, including a bank president. What I didn't know at the time when they appointed me bank president is that we were the Titanic and already hit the iceberg. Now it was my job to keep us afloat, which was an interesting period. I've traveled overseas. Uh, I visited more countries. I think I have states. I've been teaching here at Moorpark College since 1979 when I got my junior college teaching credential. I'm uh, still teaching here as well. I'm also a full-time professor at California Lutheran University, so so much for retirement. I get to do what I really love, and that's teaching. Uh, with that, I'd like to be able to present some um, slides which we're going to go through and hopefully some takeaways when you leave here this afternoon, particularly when it comes to doing personal budgets and handling your personal credit. So what I will try to do is allow questions at a time at the end. Perhaps if, if, if we can do it at the end, as I go through this, perhaps I'll be able to answer some of your questions. If so, write them down so you can remember to, to ask me, and we will try to uh, cover as many things as we can when it comes to personal budgets, credit, how much money you should be putting aside for retirement, and that kind of, kind of thing as well. So let me get right into it. The objectives you can see that we hope to accomplish today, what it means, how do you become literate so you understand uh, what handling a bank account, what credit is all about, and what sources, what tools and sources that you can use to help you as you go down through this shark infested waters as I like to say. What is financial literacy? This is what's regarding the management of your money, both today as well as the future. Uh, how you can, what choices you have when it comes to borrowing money, uh, budgeting, savings, life issues, housing, which for young people, Southern California uh, must just be a dream because buying a house here in Southern California is not uh, an easy thing for a young person to do. When you look at the median price home in Ventura County, is about $750,000. And I doubt that mo most of you have 20% down, let alone making the payments on it. So we will talk about that as well. Unemployment, hopefully we won't have to talk about that. Bills, family, et cetera, which will all be part of this process. Why do we become literate, uh, average student who enters college does not have the basic skills. I would guess if I ask how many of you have checking accounts at banks, raise your hand. Okay, most of you do. How many of you have credit cards in your own name? Wow, that's more than I thought. All of you balance your checkbooks every month? Yes? You actually go through the process of taking the bank's ending balance, adding deposits that are not, that are in your checkbook, they're not to the bank, minus your checks outstanding. You all do that? <laughs> well, maybe a lot of you get online every day, so you check and see what's posted, but how do you know how much you can write a check for if you don't keep a running balance? Earnings power, and again, savings and investing, we will be talking about. Did it go to the next one? No. Statistics, here's some interesting one. Almost two-thirds of adults admit not having a, a budget. Over 60% of adults do not have a budget, meaning this is what I take in each month, this is what I spend, the difference I'm either going to use for my personal spending or put aside for retirement, because you trust me, you're going to wake up one day and now you're 65. And now what do you do? And you're going to realize that Social Security is not going to be sufficient to cover you when you wake up to 65. I know. I'm over 65. Most adults have not reviewed their credit score. We talk about adults. Adults are 18 years of age or older. So 60% do not have any idea what their credit score is. That said, how many here know what their credit score is? And how many bureaus are there that you can check your credit score of those that answered? Three. So what we're going to learn today. 
and it's imperative that you understand your credit score at least once a year that we're going to do this. And I'm going to show you how you can do that without costing money. And in here, within the, or credit report, two-thirds within the last 12 months have not viewed their credit score. Um, for some reason it's not. Click there. More statistics. 40% of adults gave themselves a grade C, D, or F on their knowledge. 78% agree that they could benefit from additional advice. 57% indicated they're worried over lack of savings, including 43% who are concerned about not having enough rainy day money. And so we're going to talk about that. What happens in case of an emergency? You lose your job, you have a medical emergency, you're unable to work. How much money is set aside in order to cover you during this period until you're back on your feet? And hopefully none of you will face the consequence of losing your job and trying to live off unemployment insurance during this period as well until you find a job. And as you know, the most difficult time to find a job is when you don't have a job. Cash Course. This is a website that you can go to that has all sorts of tools, all of which are right here. It even has a budget that you can use. You can write down your gross income, your net income, your fixed expenses. It's a good website to help you. And if this doesn't help you, you can email me and I'll be glad to give you some other um, websites that you can use. It also talks about those of you who invest excess funds into the stock market. The stock market is still the number one uh, vehicle for increasing capital gains, increasing your net worth. Here in Southern California, those of us who own homes, we have seen a fairly decent appreciation of our home values. But in a nation as a whole, the stock market is still the number one vehicle for over the long run. It's about 10% a year since 1950s of, of appreciating your assets. So when we talk about some of the options, mutual funds, the difference between this and this and in bonds. We're going to, uh, unfortunately today, I don't think we'll have time to talk about it. We used to have a class here at Moore Park College in the business department called personal finance. And in that personal finance class, unless it's now being taught, it still isn't, uh, that we covered all of these subjects over a semester. So that's three hours times 15. That's 45 hours to cover this. I've got like 30 minutes to do this. So I'm just going to do it in tops of the waves. Just real briefly, this is a real popular one, the mutual funds. Uh, in this room, let's say I took $100 from all of you. And so we, we, we take that money, accumulate it, and invest it into various stocks. Each one of us, if you were to buy a stock, you've got to pay the full value of that stock. So say you want to buy Baidu, you're going to have to s spend the three or $400 per share. But collectively, we can all buy stock, pool it together, and, and all have an interest in it. So in this case, there's about 15 of us. We can take one fifteenth of that whole fund would be our interest. That's what a mutual fund is. You can actually pick out funds that are in the pharmaceutical industry, that are in the manufacturing industry, the service industry. It's something to your liking that you can do. So I would recommend to any of you that you take a personal finance class so that you can talk about this versus this. Bonds are probably not something that you're going to be looking at at this present time, but certainly some point in the future. I don't think you can even see this, so I'll just move along. That's pretty small. Uh, this is how what the website looks like. It can help you in terms of giving you aids. You can see, again, you can't see what's listed here on this uh, on the topics, but you can click on it and be able to go to something that matches your personal interest. Separate needs from wants. Obviously, there's a, you have a wish list and there's one that we look at that you need to do. As you can see, needs are generally fixed expenses that you're going to have to pay. Your rent, your car payment, your health insurance, as you all know now, that all of us that are 18 years of age or older under Obamacare uh, or the Affordable Care Act, we all have to have insurance. So whether you're getting it on your own or through your employer, that's now an expense that we're all looking at uh, in terms of 
of, of us having to pay in the future. Taxes, I just had my tax appointment this morning, and unfortunately it wasn't a very pleasant experience. So there are, government still collects taxes. Child care, at a point where you reach, as my daughter has two children, that, uh, two grandchildren that I have, you still got to care for your children. And if you're working, uh, you've got to balance that, the cost of that versus uh, you not working. So it's generally it's you, to your benefit to work, but child care is still a, a considerable expense. That's the needs list. Wants are those that you can either choose to do or not choose to do. And we put cable here um, that, you know, if, if, if a co push comes to shove and you can't afford to make your needs list, you can start cutting your wants list. So this is very important to the bank because when the bank looks at you from a credit risk standpoint, they're going to view what your fixed expenses are and they're going to look for the difference between that and your net income, which is what we call discretionary income. And that's what you're going to use to pay this as well as any future um, expenses like a car, a new car that you need to get. So that's going to be what the bank's going to determine your eligibility for that, which we'll talk about. First thing that all of you should do, even here in college, is to develop a budget. And this is how you do that. You start at the beginning of each month. Pay yourself first. Keep track of everything you spend, everything that you spend. For those of us at California Lutheran University, we have the largest Starbucks in Southern California on campus. And so it's, it's a temptation every day when you walk by it uh, not to get a, a, a cup of coffee from Starbucks. Well, you start adding those up on a daily basis. It, you know what that turns out to be. And the rest of this that you use for, um, that you're spending money on. And then you're going to record your income. And then I like this one, paying your bills on time. You're going to look at all those requirements to pay your bills. That difference that you're going to have left over is hopefully what you're going to be putting in to here. Now when we say savings accounts, banks aren't paying much with savings accounts, but you're putting money aside for a rainy day fund as well as when you turn 65. For a lot of you young people, you view 65 as like Mount Everest. You know, you're not likely to climb Mount Everest in the next 10 years and so you're not going to ever retire. I remember when I was a uh, young person, when I start, first started teaching here at Moorpark College, I think I was 32 years old, I viewed 65 as something I'll never get to, so I don't need to worry about that. But you're going to wake up one day, and you're at that point, and it's going to happen to you. Anybody that's turned 65 will all say the same story. So the impact of what you do today is significantly different than, than, than what it is when you wake up at age 40 and 50 and say, I shoulda, coulda, woulda. Uh, we were using an exercise in a, in a corporate finance class of using present value, future value. And what would it take now, most young people say, I should have a million and a half when I'm 65. So what is it going to take per month, assuming I can compound the interest, that I have to put aside in order to get to that million and a half figure? It is significantly different when you start at 25 versus 40 of how much money you have to put aside to get to that number. Things to consider. Obviously, the unexpected. I know in my car, my transmission is starting to go. It's now locking itself in second gear. And so I know that I'm going to be facing uh, a bill of $3,500 to $5,000. So I already know that that's going to be happening. I've got 150,000 miles on it. I thought I would have gotten a few more. but So that's where I say unexpected uh, expenses. Most of you, you shouldn't have this as an unexpected issue. Healthcare costs that you go to the doctor for a routine physical, then you find out that you've got a fairly significant medical issue, which I happened to me two years ago. Just a routine physical, and it turned out to be an operation that I had at Cedar sinai uh, within uh, nine months of that date. And this was just a physical. So I am really uh, convinced that once you get to age 40 that you have annual physicals, even if the doctor's just taking your pulse and your temperature. Uh, prioritize what, whatever dollars are left over, how you're going to keep those and how you're going to spend those. 
and then again, you're going to track your expenses and compare those against your budget. So here you develop a budget, and then you're going to check yourself how well you've done with that. Most of us don't think that. So if you're thinking about going to the movies over the weekend, how much have you spent prior this month for entertainment versus just going out to the movie uh, this weekend? I mean, you're not tracking those kind of expenses, and that's very important to do. Again, we get back to that earlier statistic that 60% of adults aren't keeping or have not prepared a budget, number one. Number two, aren't comparing their, their disbursements against that budget. That budget becomes your roadmap. You follow that. That becomes, I shouldn't go this weekend. It's toward the end of the month. I allocated $50 this month for entertainment. I've already spent $50. I'm going to have to tell my friends I'm not going to the movie this month. We've got to wait till March. I bet most of you don't do that. Again, the statistics say 60% of you don't. Banking and savings. Here gives you, again, this is assuming an interest rate that's fairly significant, but compounding is a term called you're getting interest on top of interest. So if I deposit $100 into my bank account uh, at the beginning of the month and at the end of the month I'm paid 1%, so 1 12th of 1%, so now let's say, just for argument's sake, it's $100.50. The next month the interest is based on $100.50. The interest keeps adding to it. That's what compounding is. Compounding means going forward. So you can see here, as little as $50 a month in 10 years, you can have $7,000 put away. It's a long way from the million and a half, but it's certainly giving you, and more importantly, you're developing a habit, and it becomes part of your life that you're putting money aside and that for something in the future. Because trust me, the last thing you want to do when you turn 65 is not be able to do the things that you have up to that point. Every person that's worked for 40 years will say, I can't wait for the day that I don't have to set my alarm for 5 or 6 in the morning. I can do what I want to do. Well, when that day comes, you want to be able to do that. What you're going to find, though, when that day comes, you're going to say, gosh, I don't have to get up this morning. I don't have to set my alarm. You're going to miss that. And that's what I've done. I don't ever want to just sit at home. But at least it's my choice. And I don't have to worry about the financial side. $500 a month will get you $73,000. And this is based on a 4% rate, which is a little on the high side. But over the next 10 to 20 years, 4% is probably applicable. OK, how do I establish good credit? We're getting back to credit scores, and this is really part of the impetus of, of of my talk this afternoon. I wish I would have done this, uh, I could put this up on a slide, but there's a credit score developed by a company called Fair Isaac's Company. They have shortened the acronym for that is FICO. So you've heard of FICO scores, right? You hear it's credit score, but FICO, Fair Isaac's is the one who developed that credit model, the algorithms associated with that credit model. Credit scores are anywhere from 1 to 850. Obviously, in this case, the closer to the 850 that you get, the closer to the excellent top tier that you can attain. So below 700 is considered to be average. So 6 to 700 is average. Below average is 500 to 600. You can name your own price when you're above 700, 720 uh, the score that I like. So Fair Isaacs developed this credit scoring model. All three credit bureaus, which are Experian, Equifax, and TransUnion, listed in that order in terms of their size. Everybody uses Experian, but the other two are also there, and there could be differences. American Express may report on one, not on the other, but again, Experian is probably the largest. So when you do get your credit scores, you want to get them from all three bureaus. So if you see there's a problem on one, why isn't that, uh, or I mean, one is showing credit and the other one isn't, and there's a significant difference in score, you want to be able to understand that, particularly if the lender is only running one of the credit bureaus. So how is that comprised? Out of the score of, say, 700, 30% of that credit score is based on how much you owe, which I'll talk about in a minute. 35%, over a third of it, is based on your 
payment history that you pay your bills on time. 10% is how much new credit have you gotten recently. 15% is the length of time that you've had credit. And 10% how you've mixed it up. You've got a department store, you've got a American Express, you've got a Visa MasterCard, um, and you've mixed them up, and they're all not just one or two industries, they are uh, multiple industries, not much with that. The biggest component of this is your credit, your payment history. So you, you, you get a charge card, and you use your, your Visa card to go out to a restaurant, and you spend $100. That bill will typically take 25 days to be paid from the date you receive it, that theoretically could be almost two months. If you pay it before that 25th day, then you're going to be viewed as pay making your payment satisfactorily. satisfactorily. If you miss that payment that's due 25 days after the billing, some lenders will ding you as a 30-day late. Others will wait one more month because you're really not 30 days late until 30 days past that. But if you read the fine print, whatever credit card company you get, you determine Number one, when they charge you a late charge, and then when they start counting you delinquent. Well, that delinquency, that 30-day delinquency, can take 50 points off your credit score. So here you're with a 720, and you think you have a great credit score. You go off on vacation, forget to make a payment, and now you go from a 720 to, to a 670, so now you've gone from an excellent category down to an average category. Good is probably 675 to 720, so you're down actually below that. And that's going to make a significant difference for a lot of reasons. So your credit history is huge. The number two spot I talked about is the amount owed. So what the credit bureaus will do in the model of Fair Isaacs, FICO, is to take all of your credit cards and total them up of your availability. So let's say you've got five different credit cards. Each one is $2,000. So you have $20,000 of available credit. They will take what you owe at month end and divide it into that $20,000. If you owe more than 25% against that $20,000, you're now in what we call a higher risk category. Therefore, your credit score is going to be lowered now because you're considered to be in a category of approaching bankruptcy. It doesn't say you're going to be bankruptcy, but you're moving toward that. So your credit score can be lowered 25 to 50 basis points because you owe more than 25% against your credit cards. So be careful of that. Make sure you pay these off. The other thing they will look for, of those five credit cards that I just mentioned, if one of them that you've used and you owe all of it against that credit card at that particular point where it's, it's generated and reported to the credit card company, that can lower your score 10 points. So make sure you don't go up to the limit on your credit cards, and if you do, then it's not reported at the credit bureau, meaning you pay your credit card on the 15th, the end of the month is when they report it, that at the end of the month you're not going to show that you owed 2000 against that credit card. Another thing that can happen to you is inquiries. So, for example, you're going to decide to buy a new car. So I'm going to go to five different car dealers. I don't know what car I want to get, but I'm going to go to five different car dealers on a Saturday. Up to two years ago, before um, Experian, Equifax, and TransUnion changed their policy, you were dinged three points for every time you had a credit inquiry on your on your um, your your, your uh, credit history. Now, if, if within a three-day period you go to the same industry-related, you only be dinged once. So here you're going to go from a Mercedes dealer. I'm sure all of you would like to have a Mercedes to a BMW to a Volvo. You're not being dinged three points every time that you're going from dealer to dealer. But do keep in mind when they ask you, do you want to test drive the car? They're going to ask you for a copy of your driver's license to prove and probably your insurance. They have enough information right there to run your credit report. Tell them, do not run my credit report. You may take a copy of my driver's license. You may take a copy of my insurance card. You do not have my authority to run my credit. Only when I tell you. Once you make that statement, you now have a claim against the credit card company because you didn't sign anything, nor did you give verbal approval for that. So be careful of that. 
what they want to do while you're test driving the car is risk rate you so they know that that they can roll the car with you, meaning that they don't have to worry about the bank opening up on Monday to get their permission. They know you fit the guidelines because you have a great FICO score. They can now negotiate the car because once you go into the car dealer, they don't want to lose you. They have a hard enough time getting you in there. So once you're into the dealership, they're going to take advantage of that. They don't want you walking out. And you know, once you've walked out, they've lost a, you know, they've lost a customer. So be careful about allowing people to run your credit report because you're going to lose three points. Now, why would you lose three points? Somebody else looking at your credit report that can see five different inquiries over a two-month period and you don't see any loans below that, what's the assumption? You've applied for credit and you didn't get the loan, so you've been turned down. Why would you ask somebody to look at your credit and not get credit from them? So be careful of having people run your credit. You should always get your own credit report. Even if it costs you, you get one free one a year, but even if it costs you, that's a lot cheaper in the long run than spend the $15 for a credit report. Now you've got it in your hand. Plus you can take that along to the car dealer, or whoever else, show it to them. Say, here's my credit report. You can look at it. You can see how, but don't run my credit report until I want you to. Okay, so that's an important thing to know. So when it comes to credit scores, this is the category that you want to be, and there's a lot of reasons for that. You'll notice that Toyota, when they advertise that we, you can buy a Prius, and if you are a tier one credit um, person, we'll give you the 0% interest rate. Well, tier one is 720 or above. Below that, you're tier two and tier three, which means you're gonna pay a higher rate. So if you look at the fine print, that 0% financing or 0.9% financing the dealer will tell you that's based on tier one. You'll see some of the uh, credit unions advertising new car loan rates at 1.9%. If you read the fine print, it also says that you are above average credit. That's the conditions for it. So having a good credit score is going to affect you borrowing money the cost of it. The second thing it's going to affect is jobs. In the past, since the state legislature passed a law now that stipulates that employers cannot run credit reports on you unless it can be shown that that credit report in your credit history is directly related to your job. So if I'm on the manufacturing line at a company like Vitesse and Camarillo where I'm making semiconductors, what difference does my credit report mean if I'm a 500 or a 700 in terms of my production? It's not been a proven direct relationship. But since I re retired from banking, I was in the business of advising people about financial matters. So how am I going to advise somebody about a financial matter when I can't handle my own credit? So that's important, and that can be used to whether I get a job or not. That's number two. Number three, that the credit, uh, uh, cre a low credit score will will have a negative effect on you will be when it comes to buying insurance. Right now, there was three years ago, um, most state farm farmers, 20th century, it's now 22nd century, I think, um, I can't even remember mine, Mercury, uh, they were running your credit reports. And they were risk rating you based on your credit score, meaning the more difficulty you're having managing your credit, you're a higher risk. Well, the Insurance Commissioner of California said, no, you can't do that. I haven't seen enough evidence to that. Already, they'll do it based on whether you're a good student or not. So those of you who have a B average have a history of being a better driver than those who aren't a B average. Just a fact. They've got the actuari actuarial tables to show that. Well, this day is coming. I would believe by the end of this year, all of the major car insurance companies will be running your credit report and risk rating you not, all, not, be, all, not only based on your age, whether you're married or single, whether you're male or female. Right now, females still get better car rates than males. Why is that? Why is that? Women are better drivers, aren't they? It's a proven fact. Same thing with students that are B average or above. Not only is it going to help you transfer to a four-year school from Moore Park, but it's going to help you when it comes to getting insurance. Those are just the facts. Insurance companies keep 
skewed statistics on that. I also see that day coming where health insurance, when you're getting a health insurance policy for the first time, when they do a history of your medical history, they're also going to look about whether you're what your credit score is. Why? The higher the credit score, less stress that you have. Lower your credit score, the more stress that you have, and the more chances that you could personally have medical issues. Life insurance policies, that's going to be taken into consideration. Homeowners insurance, renters insurance, all of that. So if I haven't convinced you that this is one of the most important things that is faced with you, please do. That's the takeaway today. The first thing I want all of you to do after you leave today is go to that free credit. You can actually go to Google, freecreditreport.com. Type in, put your information in. You can get a free credit report and credit score, all three. Now you're going to scan that and keep it in your computer and compare that six months to 12 months from now and see how well you're doing. The last thing you want to do is start applying for a job or a credit when you don't know what your score is. Uh, and one thing I meant to say earlier, and this is a frustration, and it's just one of those things. Banks get a different credit score than you do. So you think you may have a 720? A bank will run your credit report and actually come up with a number 700, 705. Fair Isaacs has never been able to explain why that difference occurs, why the banks get it. So the moral to that story is make sure your credit score is high enough that you can deduct 10 to 15 points from it because the bank is likely to get one that's a lesser score. And I still can't give an answer to that. Nobody in the banking industry knows either. We just accept that as part of the, part of the business. So I hope I've convinced you that this may be, other than your grades, your GPA that you have here at Moore Park College, your credit score is probably as even with that because it's going to affect your actions in the future as well as you getting a college degree. You want to get the best job that you could possibly have, and you don't want this to come back and be a reason for denial. It may be because you didn't do a good job interview, there was something wrong, you didn't have the experience. You don't want this to become the difference between you getting a job and not getting a job. Okay? Let's see what else we have. How do you access your credit report? Here's the one you get it for free, annualcreditreport.com. Once a year, you get it for free. I think you can actually go to the website, freecreditreport.com, and get one from them, too. And this will not show as an inquiry on your credit report when you get your own reports. These are the three. This is the largest, number two, number three. TransUnion is used by formerly savings and loans that ran, or mortgage companies that run your, that look at you from a mortgage standpoint. Uh, Experian is the largest consumer one, meaning car loans, credit cards, that sort of thing. What happens when I have a bad credit report? This is a big one. Uh, renting an apartment building. They're going to risk rate you uh, because it's so difficult to remove a tenant that doesn't make their rent payments. It takes them a period of time to, to go to the court and get a sheriff to get you out, to get you removed. I don't mean to say it in that vein, but that could be 60 days. So the landlords have lost two months' worth of rent. And typically, those who aren't paying rent aren't taking care of the place either. So now you're going to be left with what's after you've removed the party. So, so you don't have the 20% down to buy a house. Now you've got to rent. That's going to be coming. Obviously, buying a house is going to, that's a different issue. May not be able to purchase or lease the car. I don't recommend leasing unless you talk to somebody. Don't do that. You may or not be able to obtain other forms of credit. Other forms of credit, you decide that you want to get a Costco. Now it's going to be a Costco Visa card, and you want to get that because you get 3% off every time you use your new Visa. They're switching from American Express to Visa. So that's a huge savings for you. So you use that Costco card every time you go to Costco. Already Costco's gas. I got Costco gas at 220 today a gallon. And you get 3% off of that. It pays to use credit cards in that proper function as long as you pay them off because you've got to pay for gas anyway. So you might as well take advantage of that. Um, you can be turned down for a job. Yes, you can. 
so here's an employer who's got a position available they get a hundred applications in the first thing they're going to do is look for reasons to turn you down so they don't have to interview you i say that in euphemistic way they're looking for mistakes on your resume here you're applying for a job at macy's and you write on your letter dear jc penny you, you don't even know who you're applying to you make errors that kind of thing well the other one is um, that you're that um, that you know your credit report is such that when you've reached the final candidates when they start doing the background investigation you've made it all the way through the interview process and now they turn you down because you're not meeting their minimum standards when it comes to credit it's like getting a bad grade it stays on your permanent record well th that's true a negative item on your credit report will stay for ten for seven years if you file bankruptcy for ten years so if you have a 30-day late with Macy's that will stay on your credit report for seven years seven years so that old adage of breaking a mirror seven years of bad luck that's a long time to have 50 points deducted on your credit report as time goes along if you haven't had others that will start reducing but it won't get back to zero of those 50 points until it goes off the uh, your permanent record here's some of the uh, contact information here at Moorpark College for you to get help. I also recommend that you spend some time looking at websites handling personal finance. If you can take a class in personal finance, that, that's a, a real help to you to do the, to, to prepare a budget. Um, I, I, all of you have raised your hands that you've gotten a credit card. I've quite often in my classes I had students say, how do I get credit when I don't have it? I don't think we need to talk about that today because you all had credit cards. But just handle these things correctly. Don't make mistakes. Do a budget so you know what your, your available money is. You know what your fixed expenses are. That difference is money that you can use to spend, such as going to the movie, um, if you want to buy a new car, you'll be able to do that. You can plan for that day. And then you've got enough money set aside that will cover you. If you have a major medical issue, and if you've got a high deductible, which a lot of people do right now, that you've got to cover that. So to get the cheapest health insurance, you have a $2,000 deductible. How many of you have $2,000 to pay for that? When I went to the hospital, my deductible was taken right away. I didn't have a choice about that. So you want to make sure that those kind of events you won't have to worry about or anybody else worries about uh, your family members as well so I hope that this is some takeaways that you can have that that at least gives you the tops of the waves again I've talked in 30 minutes or 35 minutes what we talk about over an entire semester class but I think you at least have some awareness and particularly with the two issues of a budget and credit. So what I would like to do, because we only have a few more minutes now, is open up for questions. I said we would do that at the end. You gotta have questions. Yes, sir. How will they, oh, it's gonna get you a microphone so that everybody can hear it. Um, do you have a credit score? Credit score? You're saying as a debit card count as a credit score? Yeah. No. So you need to have a credit card. Correct. But l let me, talk about that real quick um, all of you know what a debit card looks like it's like a duck that walks like but doesn't quack um, it is used in the same vein as a credit card if you don't choose the pin you get some benefits like you get up to six months to return the merchandise as long as it's in the original container and that hasn't been hasn't been uh, worn you can return it under a credit card. Now, the merchant may tell you our policy is to give you store credit. No, they have to credit your money back. So as long as you witness the fact you've returned that merchandise, a debit card used as a credit gives you that same provision. Versus writing a check or paying cash, now they can give you store credit. So that's one more thing that at least a debit card, using it as a credit card. But no, it doesn't. What it does help you, though, is establish a relationship with the bank. For those of you who are also students, which all of you are, some banks will give you credit as a freshman, sophomore, junior, senior. 
as you get closer to getting your degree, they will give you credit lines based on, raise those credit lines based on your year at, at school. And then when you do graduate, there are some car manufacturers like Nissan and Toyota that will actually lend money to you because you're now a recent graduate. So those are some things to uh, keep in mind. So good question about the debit card. Always use it as a credit card when you use the debit card. Don't put in your PIN because once you've done that, you've lost that, that ability because it's treated as cash at that point. Anybody else? Dean Nicholas. I think the bigger question if you're a young person is do you want to get a credit card and establish credit or do you want to be a really good budgeter and always stay within your cash <laughs> budget? Uh, good question. Um, you want to get to establish credit. It takes six months from the time you get a card or a car loan before you're rated about whether you're paying it satisfactory. You got to make six payments. So yes, you want to get a credit card. I've got a it's interesting. Uh, is there anybody else that has a question? I have an interesting, uh, I'll get to you in just a second. There was a minister of a church in Thousand Oaks who never had a credit card and took his first trip, and he's 55 years of age. And he wanted to get a hotel room and rent a car. He didn't have a credit card. So we worked it out. When he, you looked at his credit report, he never believed in borrowing money. Now that day came. You're going to want a credit card for nothing else if you have to rent a car, stay in a motel, and it establishes credit. That's going to be the determinant for you developing a credit score. Without that, you're not going to have a credit score. The bank who runs your, or a lender who runs your credit report, you're not going to be rated at all. You will have no score. Not one or two, zero. You're not going to have, they'll say not rated. Yes, sir, you had another question. Why does the credit score only go up to like 850? Why is it 850 specifically and not like another number like 1,000 or something? <laughs> Good question, because uh, that's the way FICO developed it. Their algorithms went to 850. There's another one coming out that's going to 1,000, but it hasn't made the inroads because it, it takes a tremendous amount of history. You've got to convince all of the department stores and credit card companies to use you. Uh, right now, FICO has the, their 99.9% .9 of the credit business in terms of risk rating. 850 is just what they came up with. They will never tell you why, it's just what they do. I agree, I always thought that was kind of strange. Because if you're looking at a percentage, 720 divided by 850, it's easy to take 850 out of 1,000 and say you're 85%. No, that's, that's FICO just came up with 850. It is what it is. I have I've probably had that asked to me a thousand times in banking, and I've given you the same answer. I, nobody can tell you. It's just what they, what, how they established it. Anybody else? All right. Well, thank you for coming. I know some of you came because you part of your class. I hope you were able to have a couple of takeaways and. And you can email me here at Moore Park College. It's tweaver at vcccd.edu if you need to get a hold of me. I do teach in the business department. You'll see me listed in the schedule of classes. So if you ever have any questions, feel free to ask. Best of luck to all of you. Thank you. Thank you.